he has been gardening since preschool with his grandparents and they used or, organic methods. So he is, he knows all about organic methods and, ca and compost. They use lots of compost, right? Yep. Like he also compost. learned, he also learned how to trim fruit trees and other trees from his grandfather. He became okay. a certified master gardener and developed a veggie garden at the senior center in Hillsdale. And this is neat. He even had the garden plowed by mules and draft horses. So it was uh, pretty authentic. And that went on for quite a while, didn't it, Al? Like, uh, it's probably still going on. Oh, great, the, great. The woman who um, ran the Master Gardener course down there when I moved away, she took it over. Yeah, it was for free food for the seniors. They were all heirloom varieties. Great. And all organic. Great. Yeah. Um, and then when he moved up here in 2013, he started working for me and I had a small landscape company. So that was fun having him on. He was our tree trimmer and bushwhacker, right? Bushwhacker, I like that. <laughs> bush butcherer, bushwhacker. Right, right. Um, and I retired and then he took over some of my clients and he called his business Mr. Naturals Garden LLC when he practiced organic methods and then he retired in 2020 and now just works on his own little micro farm in yeah. his backyard so i would like to uh welcome al alan haslam mr natural yay thank you julia thanks for all you do thank you thank everybody you. for being here um i was pretty overwhelmed with this project, you know, I was, I was happy uh, to say yes to it, but I got into this and it's like, oh my God, where do I start? You know, there's, there is just so much, it's so vast of a topic um, and there's so many variables to everything. So I've made some cheat sheets here. And one thing that I'd really like to stress, there is a, there's a best way to do everything. I think it's called best practices. Um, so I think it's really important, whatever you, we do, you know, I have, I have a lot of books, um, a lot of gardening books, but I've, I've got that list down and, and you shared that list. That's for everybody to see, right? I will. Yeah. I'm having so, trouble okay. with it right now. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm down to, if you were going to throw out every book in gardening and have just one this book here is so awesome. It is so comprehensive. Everything you want to know is in here. It's the Gardener's A to Z Guide to Growing Organic Food. I don't know a lot about flowers. I've always been, you know, more interested in eating food. Um, I love flowers. They're nice to look at, but uh, my wife Lynn does more of the flower work. But this book is awesome. And Julia's going to get that list to you. Um, so I just want to encourage everybody, you know, I'm not a garden guru. I don't know, have all the answers, but I'm, I'm smart enough to go to the experts when I do something and find out what's the right way to do it. Um, my, my passion is um, pruning for the health of the shrub or the tree ornamentals and for aesthetic design. It's um to me, it's art and the science, the science being the correct way to do things for the health of the tree. And the art is um, designing and which takes a, a lot of different variables into, into play there. Um, so anyway, I would like to recommend the Master Gardener course. I took it in 2005. It, I don't know if it still is, but it was 12 weeks, one class a week, each class is three hours and each class focuses on one specialty. For example, uh, one would be all the brambles. Another one might be lawn care. Another would be um, pesticide use. And they would bring, they would bring an expert in on that field for that class. And, and, um, and you do get tests, quizzes and tests. I passed the test at the end of the course with 100%. Um, I've learned some things since then and i've forgotten some things since then but i highly recommend the course it's it's really good and 
then the other recommendation is your agricultural extension, the MSU extension. They are awesome for answering questions. Anything that I can't answer, that's where I go, either there or the A to Z Gardener's Guide to Growing Organic Food, um, my references. And then Google, you know, Google it. I, I brought that down to one word, Google it. So if you have a question, um, it's, it's the computer's great. I mean, I've gathered all these books over the years and I'm kind of a neo Luddite, but boy, if you, if you get it down to the most succinct or concise phrase and ask the question, and then I would say, don't, don't go to the, what I call pop gardening sites, um, go to the extension sites. MSU's is awesome. Um, Minnesota's is really good. Pennsylvania and Ohio. I always look for the extension sites to answer my questions. And then if you have a problem in your yard that you can't identify or know what to do with, you can contact them. There's a form you can fill out. Um, you can send in samples, you can send in pictures. You would take a close up picture of the problem and a picture of the overall plant. Um, so that's, that's a really great resource. The internet, books, the library. Um, so I don't know if everybody here is already a gardener. I know some of you are. I have, uh, you know, why garden? So some things, one thing is food security. We did that for a few, several years ago with, um, what was his name? Peter, the permaculture guy, author. And um, food security. Peter Bain. You know, Peter Bain, yeah, yeah. Um, I think we all are aware that food prices are going to rise and continue to rise. I believe the industrial food system is pretty broken. Um, there's going to be more um, shipping problems. There's more problems coming up from climate change, which is going to affect the gardens and our plants. But I just think it's a smart thing to do if you're able to and have the property to grow as much food as we can. We focus in our garden. We don't do a lot of exotic things. We just basically grow what we eat the most of um, and, and keep it fairly simple. And it's, we have a small garden. We have, I have um, six four by four raised beds and two that are about five by 20. And um, so pretty limited. We really like to focus on greens, cucumbers, onions, you know, just the basics. But food security is going to be a thing more and more in the future. So I think it's important to get ahead of it because if you garden organically, your garden should get better. The soil should get better. You learn as you go. Um, so get a head start on that would be my suggestion. Um, another reason to garden is for healthy, fresh food. The taste is above and beyond than anything you're going to buy. We don't know. I mean, I don't even, I don't totally trust the, um, the EPA and the so-called controls who, you know, the watchdog groups have been kind of had the teeth taken out of them. I think um, the only way for sure you can know is grow it yourself. Um, the variety of foods you can grow as opposed to what you buy in the store is so much greater with uh, the seed catalogs, saving seed catalogs now and Baker Creek catalog. And there's so many varieties that you don't get in the store. You might get a couple varieties of cucumbers or something, but when there's so many um, savings, saving money, that's part of the food security is as uh, price of food goes up and, and our wages or our pension fund or whatever stays stagnant, you know, um, we can save money. It's convenient. You can run out in the backyard and it's very satisfying to us to, to go pick our food for our meal. Um, don't have to leave the house, don't have to drive, don't have to get exposed to people not wearing masks and so on and so forth. Um, we're happily heading towards our hermitage and it's great exercise, full body exercises, you know, the stretching, bending, lifting, pushing a wheelbarrow, um, shoveling, raking. It's all good exercise outdoors. That's all good. 
So those are some kind of some reasons to garden. I like to think of our garden as our whole yard, not compartmentalized. Like okay, over here's the garden, that's where we grow our food. And over here's the flower garden. In fact, there's one really good book called The Beautiful Food Garden, and it's about blending everything together um, for getting some feedback. Uh, your TV on or something? Radio? I don't know. I'm hearing that also. No, I, no, I have huh. my earplugs. Okay. It looks like um, uh, there's a couple people that are not muted. Okay. Okay. Blending, blending your gardens all together. So um, you can use plant allies, um, companion planting is another word for that. Uh, and just the whole thing you have, you want to have um, a lot of birdhouses. We have like eight birdhouses around our yard because the, the wrens and the finches and the, the, the bug eating birds help you out um, with the bugs. Um, a bat house. We don't use any chemicals or fertilizers on our lawn. Um, and I notice often our front lawn is full of birds eating seeds and different things. And I look at the neighbor's lawns, there's not a single bird in their lawn and ours is full of birds. That happens a lot. Um, water, you know, so have a good bird bath. Um, I've used uh, an old Frisbee, flip it upside down and, and keep some fresh water in that and set it on the ground for the insects. Um, so, it's, you know, it's shallow and keep that fresh, you know, and they need, they come to rely on it, on those things. Just like if you're gonna feed the birds, you know, if you don't, if you start feeding the birds, especially in the winter, don't stop, you know, and, and have water for them. They rely on that. They build their homes. We see their, you know, building nests besides the birdhouses and the trees around us. Um, plant things for forage and for cover for the, uh, the beneficial, predators. Um, so the whole yard, in fact, in, in England, the English, they say, they don't say, let's go out into the yard. They say, let's go out into the garden. And that is the entire ecosystem. So I think it's good. We like to manage our property as, as an ecosystem, not just a compartmentalized um, type of garden. So it, the whole area should be organic. You know, if, if you get invasives that pop up, um, mechanical removal, and some things at some point, you might have to, you know, get a chemical out. It's a, it's a value judgment. But basically, if you stay on top of it, um, you, can, you can stay on those things. And walking through your garden every day, looking at the plants, examining them, you'll be able to catch things when they start, as far as any um, diseases or fungus. Um, and then you'll have time to figure out what that is, identify it, diagnose it, and treat it. But, you know, it's not, um, plants are, are living things, obviously, and there's a lot going on. And it's it's been said that they, you know, a plant can take quite a bit of loss, up to about 20% of damage to that plant and still produce and still survive and, and go on. So you can't freak out <laughs> um, when, when we see insects or bugs or, or spots or whatever, but it's important when you do see these things to get on them, uh, figure out what they are. Any, any dying or diseased or, um, sections of plant that don't look good or healthy, remove them right away, you know, and, and pinch them down to the, and I'll go into pruning, but, um, you know, if it's, if it's a gall or something like that, you need to get down four to six inches below it into good wood. And then there's specific things, ways to do that. And little things can make a difference. Like, uh, for example, on, on gall on forsythias, like I worked on, on Chrissy's there, um, it shouldn't be done before it rains or after it rains because 
the wetness spreads it. It has to be done very specifically. Um, you have to clean your blades between every cut. So you have a small, like a coffee can or something with a, a solution in there. You cut one, you gotta take it, put it in the bag. It's better to put it right in the bag if you're able to, not on the ground and dip your blades, you cut, dip your blades. So it's kind of labor intensive. But if you, if you just go at it willy nilly and you don't do it right, you can do more damage than good. Um, so that's, that's what I'm talking about as far as everything we do. It's so easy now with mobile phones and that, and to just ask the question and, um, you know, go to a good site and figure out what's the best way to do things so you're not doing harm instead of good. Um, a cheat sheet here. Um, let's go into the pruning next since we kind of segue in from that. Um, one of my pet peeves is, that when, and aesthetically even, is uh, stubs. When people prune and they need to prune, you need to prune down to the collar. So the, the collar is a raised ridge where the, the branch meets the main, the lar larger branch. And so again, your blades should be sharp. You should use bypass pruners, not the old anvil type, which they, they crush the plant and the bypass give a clean cut. Keep those blades sharp between every plant from one plant to the other, clean your blades so you don't spread. If you cut through a disease or fungus or something, you can spread that to the next plant. The, the three Ds, diseased, damaged, dying or dead, you can take those off at any time of the year. Um, water shoots, which are, are straight uh, branches that shoot out after, if you like do a more severe pruning or if the tree is dying back at one point, or if somebody um, girdled the tree because they forgot to take off um, a, a strap that they had it staked with and things like that, the tree will try to regenerate itself. Um, and so you've got to watch that stuff. You can take that off anytime. Water shoots, suckers sprout out from the ground, cut those off anytime because they're they're sucking nutrition that should go to the tree, the part of the tree that you want. Um, as far as a tree that has been neglected for a while, it's a process. You should not take off more than 20% of the live branches that you want to, to bring it into a, a shape or control, 20% in one year, that should always be done. Here in a cold climate, it should be done um, late winter or early spring. So you avoid any damage from uh, freeze, uh, frost or freeze damage from things that you would cut in the fall. And if you cut it to some people, well, in a different climate, a warmer climate, you can cut in the fall after things go dormant. But in, in Michigan, where you have a chance of extreme cold, uh, yeah, late winter, early spring, then the um, anything that's crossing each other or rubbing should be removed. And again, then it comes to aesthetics and design of that tree. You have to look at, walk around it, look at it. Which branch do you want to take off? Take it off down to the collar. Um, then you also want air and light to get inside. So if it gets too crowded, and even if there's no, there's no crossers, um, it gets too crowded, you don't get enough air and it sets it up for um, fungus. And it, that brings to mind another thing is don't water the plant, always water the ground. So overhead sprinklers are not good. If you, if you really need to do it that way for whatever reason, water before noon. So the plant has time to dry out because if you're watering late in the day, um, then it gets cool at night and then the water sits there. And again, you're setting it up for mold and fungus problems. So water in the morning, water the soil, not the plant. Um, as far as, um, and that brings to mind, okay, if you have aphids and some of the insect pests, you can 
water the plant, but then you would use a, a nozzle with more forceful and not, not, you don't want to power wash them, but um, something with a little more force, even your thumb and blast those aphids and things right off there. They're, they're favored by ground beetles and different things. They may or may not make their way back up to the plant. Um, that would be the one time you might actually water the plant, but again, you know, do it in, do it in the morning. So it has time to dry out. Um, yeah, let's see, do we are not trying to master nature. We can't master nature, um, but we're trying to be stewards and, and sort of helping nature. Um, so we have to accept some loss. We have to accept that, you know, it's not a machine and and we just um, you have to go with the flow to some in some points. It's good to get your garden to be self-sustaining. As far as a sustainable, is is more when you're still bringing in materials from outside of your property. Uh, you might be buying compost or importing things for your your compost, which is gets a little bit dicey. You know, you see a nice pile of grass clippings on the side of the road. You might want to knock on their door and ask them if they're using, you know, if they're spraying herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, things like that. This this time of year, it's really good because people sometimes are thatching their lawn, and um, so you have that that nitrogen-based greens to add your compost. But even if they did use fertilizers and things on it, the prior year, it's had all winter to to leach out. And so that would be okay, but um, that would be a sustainable garden. Self-sustaining garden is where you don't need to bring anything in anymore, which would go towards um, successful composting. I mean, really just not, not wasting anything and planting things for compost. I mean, if you use cover crops, um, you know, uh, the legumes, you can you cut those off at the ground and you can compost those plants and also then if you leave the roots in the ground they have nodules on them that they have fixed nitrogen from the air just leave those right in the ground and they'll they'll rot over the winter um, over you know three seasons basically the fall winter and spring and maybe till that up a little bit but you don't want to till very much at all. Um, that's the kind of the latest thinking on that. We just destroy soil structure. I mean, I remember many years ago when I got my rototiller, my first Troy built rototiller. Wow, this is great. Look at that, I can go down eight inches and just pulverize the soil. And that was that was so wrong. So um, just the you know the top the the depth of a hole, maybe two to three inches, just loosen up the top. If your garden is not compacted, you know, if it's compacted, you're going to have to get a, a fork and break it up, um, get it to a point where you can then just till the top, and lay your compost on, on the surface and, um, you know, work that in just a, a little bit because you're also killing earthworms and, and other things that you just tilling is, is not, um, it's not a hobby anymore, <laughs> no matter if you do have an awesome rototiller. Um, compost, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, raised beds are really recommended uh, for many reasons. And the big thing is that they don't get compacted if you build them to a good scale. Um, ours are four by four. The long ones, are the widest one is five foot because an average sized person can squat down on the edge of that and reach to the middle. So raised beds, um, avoiding compaction helps in a lot of ways and improves drainage. It improves aeration to, into the soil. Um, you're, not, you're not crushing roots. You're not crushing um, your worms. Um, you retain the water better. Easier to plant, weed, and maintain. I'm going to cheat sheet here. And because there's a better penetration of air, water, and sunlight, um, you generally can get higher yields too. And with the raised beds, if you design them right, 
you're you eliminate the rows that you have in the standard garden. When I, when I did the seniors garden, it was about a 50 by 100 foot um, garden. And I had rows, but not the conventional rows. You have a, a, a one row of the all one kind of plant and then a row between that that you run a rototiller through for the weeds and then another row. I did four foot wide rows 50 foot long with two spots of about 18 inches with for cut cut across and then you can you can reach the middle again and you can plant more like a square foot garden where you you can put your crops closer together whereas a standard conventional garden with all these rows you lose a lot of, of planting space that way so it's, um, you can control your medium better with that with a raised bed garden, but I think it's best to not put a bottom in the garden in the raised bed. I've seen those for sale on marketplace. Nice looking, you know, cedar um, boxes, but they they have a a floor in them, and you have your micro micro rhizole. Uh, anyways, your your fungi in the ground, and your earthworms and your earth energy and all that that I believe needs to access that raised bed garden. So um, we use, and I think um, that my friends Chuck and Karen adopted this. Um, we went to the concrete place and we got seconds of cinder blocks, which are seven inches high. So we, we leveled that, built a, a box of the cinder blocks, just one, one level high, and then set the wood box on the inner edge of those cinder blocks and then the cinder block square holes outside and surrounding that upper part of the raised bed, you can use for um, flowers, uh, beneficial herbs that attract beneficial insects or repel insects. Um, so it's, it's pretty and gives you a little bit more gardening space. And then you end up with, well, the, the raised garden bed is, uh, the wood one that we just rebuilt over the nine inch cedar one is eight inches. So you have eight plus seven, you know, what, 16, 15 inches there. Um, there's plenty of depth. And then if some of the bigger plants where the roots want to go even deeper, you don't have a floor there. The floor is sand, at least here it is. So which makes for good drainage, which is important also. Um, so that's about it for raised beds. Good root development. Um, organic, I think that's pretty much a given for everybody that's listening here. And conditioning your soil. Earthworms, and you can pull up by um, doing compost heaps in, in your garden or alongside your garden, putting down cardboard or things to pull the earthworms up and transport them to your garden. Um, Sphagnum peat moss, I used to use that, but I've become aware that it's not an environmentally sound thing to use because of the, um, the peat bogs are a really import, important carbon sink. And um, it comes from Canada, so it's not local. Um, there's some problems with that. It's an awesome medium, but um, you can get around needing that because compost. Okay, well, I don't know if anybody can hear me, but I'm gonna keep talking. Um, so COIR, C-O-I-R is from, is made from um, ground up coconut shells and that comes in bricks. That's a nice replacement for sphagnum peat moss. If you need to amend your soil that way to get more organic matter in there. You don't want too much organic matter. It's uh, about 10% is good. Um, An organic matter will bind with heavy metals. So that's that's another whole thing. It's, it's important to do, and, and I haven't done this because the way I put my soil together, everything grows well. So I have not actually done a soil test, but it's recommended that you do that um, especially if you're establishing a garden before you add amendments, because you can over amend your soil. You can get too much of 
nut some nutrients or fertilizers and you actually develop a toxicity. Um, so it's recommended that you do a soil test, uh, get your pH balanced generally between six and seven is a good balance between sweet and acidic. Um, so, okay, what's next here? Pete, forget that. Compost, composted manure is good, especially if you can find a local source of that. Somebody that has, that's raising chickens, that isn't into gardening. Rabbit manure is really good. Um, horse manure, if, you know, and it's good if those are, are cooked first. Some people, um, they do that well and it's already cooked and cured. But you definitely, and probably most of you know that, you definitely don't want to take um, fresh manure and put it in your garden. It's, it's too hot. So, but it's, it's perfect for compost as an activator. Um, tilling depth, and when if you do till and you don't want to till, um, a maximum of six to eight inches for a first tilling if you have hard soil. And MSU's done studies that most plants do well with six to eight inches. So if you're build, building a um, raised bed, you can keep that in mind. I would go personally eight inches at the very minimum because I've pulled up uh, plants that have much deeper roots than that. Um, you can solarize your garden soil uh, for starting a new bed is the best way to do it organically. You just take a uh, clear visqueen, black works too, but clear is best and lay it out where you want your new bed. Seal it down around the edges with boards, soil, rocks, whatever, and give that time. That'll solarize or cook basically um, all the seeds and the weeds and the grass and everything in there uh, and kill it all. So then you can just, um, then you have organic matter there. You can just uh, till that in lightly into your soil and uh, you don't have to use any nasty chemicals or even if you dig it all up you're still going to have grass like crazy if you're, if you're putting it in the lawn. Um, you want to rotate your crops if you have room. We can't do that like I would like to because uh, of our limited garden space but um, move your crops around that helps interrupt life cycles of insects, um, any pathogens or problems that are coming from one plant and that might not bother another plant. So rotating your crops, intercropping, um, interspersing your crops, like I talked about with the conventional gardens where you have you know a big long row of, of lettuce or beans or whatever, it's better to do pods if you're lucky enough to have some acreage or piece of land and mix everything together. That's supposed to help with the, um, with the insects in particular. Um, so they don't have this big monoculture smorgasbord and they get kind of divided up. Um, so Julia, I don't see you. I'm still, here. And I just have, there you go. Okay. You're gone and it just said Debbie. It was a black screen that said Debbie. So I didn't know if things were working right, right still. Do you see me? Good. Yeah. Okay. So you can still hear me? Yep. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, test different varieties of the same crop. Um, some will do better than others in your soil and your environment. So, and, and flavors, you know, you're going to get different flavors. So there's some good seed catalogs now and you can get um, all kinds of stuff, but boy, get them early. I mean, as soon as those seed catalogs come out, get them early because there's been a huge uptick in gardening. Um, I still haven't gotten my my um, onion starts that I should have gotten, um, other things, and I was on it really early. So um, good air circulation is really important. You, you don't want to, you want to get things close so that you can increase your yield, but not too close. And some of that can be taken care of with, with some pruning. Um, and then siting your garden where you put it. Um, you know, again, if you're, we, we have blackberries and they had to put them alongside a, a west facing fence. Uh, it wasn't ideal because of less circulation, but so far they're doing good. But uh, circulation is good. Light is important, obviously. 
Um, MSU did a study on that too, and they consider full sun six hours or more. So it doesn't have to be like all day long, but full sun for most plants um, will do well. They might not do as good as they would with more sun, but they, they will do well. Um, select your varieties carefully. Buy certified disease-free seeds or plants, which makes me think of um, raspberries. Sometimes people want, want to give away raspberries. It's not recommended to take plants like that from somebody else's garden, because if you're bringing something into your garden, that's hard to get rid of. Um, you don't know what's on what problems that might be in the roots, um, root root rot. We had raspberries here, and they got a bad case of root rot. They came up after we moved in. I said, oh, somebody had raspberries here. So I cultivated them and got them going and they all died. It was turned out it was root rot. So that's probably why they cut them back. Um, well, let's skip over. Let's go to uh, second line of defense after the first line that I just said, testing different varieties, rotating your crops, intercropping is avoid planting too deep and water from below, not above, like I mentioned before, water before noon, and don't work around or touch wet plants. That's a way to spread things. So, you know, water, water in the morning, maybe if you need to work or want to do the work, do that in the evening after they've dried and it's also getting cooler then. Um, don't touch healthy plants after working with diseased ones. So of course, if you wash your hands, then you know that would be okay, or um, use gloves and change out your gloves, but you gotta be careful about spreading things. And again, with tools, the same thing. Um, keep your tools clean and sharp. Um, avoid high nitrogen fertilizers. More nitrogen is not, it's not a case of more is good because the plant puts out a lot of leafy green growth, which makes it, wow, it looks great. You know, my plant's really doing great. It's growing like crazy, but if the energy is going into um, green, leafy green, instead of um, the fruit or vegetable. So again, a uh, soil test is a good tool for those things. Your NPK, nitrogen, um, phosphorus, and potassium balanced. And that's the good thing about using compost or manure. It's a slow release. You don't have to worry so much about burning your plants. Um, the, the compost the cow manure is used about 555 for the NPK. Um, there's other forms that are about 10, 10, 10. But again, you, you can over fertilize and um, so that's where a soil test would come in. Better to under fertilize a little bit. And then if you see something struggling, figure out what's causing that and then spot fertilize then just to a broad spectrum over, fertil over fertilization because more is not always better. And feed the soil, not the plant. And mulch. Mulch and this is a... Um, this is another thing, Julia, that I didn't, I forgot about, but this is from the great courses. They sell um, CD, sets, uh, um, CD sets on different topics. This is the science of gardening. And this is a really awesome um, program. It's uh, Linda Chalker Scott is an extension specialist in urban horticulture and a professor of horticulture at Washington State University. She received her PhD in horticulture from Oregon State University. Um, she's very well published. She's doing this, there's four CDs in here and it is, it's really awesome. So, you know, for people like, and, and that includes me, I learn better by listening to someone than I do by reading. I find sometimes I'll read something and I go, oh, what did I just read? But it seems like if I, I hear it spoken. Um, so that's the science of gardening by the great courses. I highly recommend that. Uh, um, mulch in spring or fall. Um, wood, 
chips are a really good form of mulch. There is a myth about them binding up the nitrogen in the soil. That's only true if you work it down into the soil. If you lay it on top, that doesn't happen. And the wood chips eventually from the bottom up will um, start breaking down. It, the wood chips need to be at least four to six inches deep. The deeper it is, the less problems you have with weeds. But all the good things that any mulch does, um, wood chips are generally the best for various reasons. One is they allow the water to filter through and permeate. For example, you know, these uh, cloth weed barriers that you can buy and put down. And that was one of the great things about that, that great courses. Um, she was taking things that were being marketed and testing them. You know, she's a, she's a researcher in the university and testing them. So they have these barrier cloths well and, and they let water and air through no problem and so she did a simple test put a clean sheet over a beaker and poured water on it and it didn't go through <laughs> so you know you're not getting an exchange of if, if the water won't go through air won't go through and you're not getting an exchange of air and gases from your soil um, so she highly recommends wood chips um, not, you know, they, they actually make rubber mulch from tires, which is, is a really terrible idea. Um, so mulching is a really great thing to do, but you got to be careful what you use. And, and I, I think that the wood chips are really good. Um, not wood chips that are dyed red or pretty colors. You know, but I think a lot of that dye might be soy based now, but still it's, it's, I don't know. I, I, aesthetics are important, but I think it's better to go natural. Um, and controlling the weeds, mulch is, is your best thing for that, or outside of pulling them, you know, and there's some satisfaction in pulling weeds. I enjoy pulling weeds as long as my knees can take it. It just this feels good to rip one of those little suckers out of there, you know, and, and it aerates the soil at the same time. And then you might, you know, might get some worms attached to those roots and you drop them in your worm bucket and take them go fishing later. Um, as you walk through your garden every day and, and look at things, um, remove the rotting or dead leaves, stalks, weeds, plants, anything that looks like it's dying, dead, diseased, get it off of there right away. You know, burn it or, or put it in a in a garbage bag. Don't don't throw it on the ground. Um, piles of wood and garden debris shouldn't be around the garden. Um, piles of wood, you know, we we have a wood stove, and we have a, a pile of wood that we try to keep kind of neat. That's not far from our garden, um, so that's not ideal. But generally, it's recommended that you know because of the bugs that go with the wood. And they might just bail out of the wood and say, woohoo, look at this garden here. Let's go eat some of that. Um, plus, wood piles attract other things that you might not want to deal with. Um, we don't have a problem with rats here, but wood piles are great for attracting rats. But we have a rat terrier, so that kind of, you know, helps with the um, vermin, like those little chipmunks that I watched biting the... Um, squash flowers off my squash plants and spitting them out on the ground. They didn't even eat the flowers, which are edible. They're just, just being little stinkers. Well, the next day in that same little garden, there was a dead chipmunk that um, my rat terrier killed. And I don't take any pleasure in that, but she has reduced the predation from squirrels and rabbits and chipmunks in our yard, I'd say by 90%. It's rare we see one in our yard now. And when they are in our yard, they're sneaking around. Um, so I highly recommend the small terriers. They're, they're cheap to feed and uh, good little lap dogs. And anyway, I digress. Um, orchards, if you have fruit trees and that, keep your grass mowed around there. Uh, mulch around the tree out to the drip line is best. And then any weeds that do pop up in there, weeds are way easier to pull 
if you have a good deep wood mulch. Um, and I already talked about disinfecting your tools. And in extremely hot weather, which we're gonna get more and more of, it's recommended that you try to shade your plants. You can do that with floating roll covers. You can do it with cheesecloth, um, but that can be a damaging. But again, if we're forecast, we're lucky to have you know that technology. We can check the weather ahead of time. Well, at least you know a couple hours ahead of time, they're pretty accurate. Then um, <laughs> you can water. You know, give them some extra water and give it to them again in the morning. So during the heat of the day, they have that water there to help them out. Protect from freezes, you know, obvious things. Uh, fruits and vegetables that are on the vine, once they're ready to harvest, even if you're not ready to eat them, pick them. Don't let them, don't let them sit there and get overripe or rot. Um, you know, pick them and give them to your neighbor or friends or family or something. Um, or, or freeze them or can them or whatever you have time for, but uh, promptly harvest those. Anything that falls on the ground from your fruit trees, your um, vegetable plants, whatever, same thing. Get it off the ground right away before some pathogen gets into the soil. Some of those things can stay in the soil up to 15 years. Um, you remove your plants immediately after harvest. There's a couple different ways of thinking about garden debris there's one is that you know you want to leave some of that for overwintering um, beneficial insects and then the other is that well they're not the only things that overwinter in that and then also if you have any diseased plants or leaves or anything if you don't clean that up it can transmit to the soil so i tend to be more you know i have a i have a beneficial insectary garden just plants in it for the beneficial insects um, but in my food garden i like to keep that i like to keep that clean um, they can there's other areas in our yard where they can find places for that but uh yeah destroyed those things uh fault fault cultivation is really a good thing to do because um grubs and slugs and um, those kind of things that are in the soil to be there till next spring. Once you pull all your plants out and clean off the surface, then you can cultivate that down a ways with a hole and kind of turn that up and that'll expose some of those grubs and slugs, um, snails and whatever, and for the birds and the birds that you're providing water and birdhouses for will help you out with those. So fall cultivation is a good thing. It's also a great um, or shred leaves. And once you get that cultivation done, you leave it bare for a few days, give the birds a chance and then smooth it out a little bit, pile a bunch of leaves on it. Like we had, we have carrots in the spring that were planted last fall. Um, they overwintered fine. We're pulling nice fresh carrots, you know. I have been for since the soil um, warmed up. Um, same with um, Swiss chard and onions and things like that. If you're uh, some of the root crops, if you put a nice bunch of leaves on there, that can help you have them there in spring. Uh, and borders, like I talked about with the raised garden, with the cinder blocks or any borders, and you can use uh, valerian, hyssop, lemon balm, yarrow, things like that, um, that attract beneficial insects. They're, they're pretty. They're herbs that you can use. Uh, valerian makes a good tea to knock you right out, help you sleep. Um, so borders are nice in, in a couple ways, aesthetically and practically. Trellises and stakes and A-frames and teepees are space efficient. Um, I'm gonna do some new stuff this year in that way um, off of our deck with trellises. And you get better light and air circulation. You have the fruit is not laying on the ground, but like squash and things like that. You can have it suspended in the air. If you do have squash and things, 
uh, when it's laying on the ground, it's best to go over there and gently lift it up and stick a handful of straw um, or some other type of, of you know, a one inch of grass clippings or something. If grass clippings, you got to be careful. If you put grass clippings down too thick, more than more than an inch, they they tend to get kind of nasty and and start to rot. So um, the straw is really good for that. And that keeps them off the soil so the bugs don't find them and burrow up into your squash. Row covers. Personally, I've never used row covers. I know they're a good thing to do. Uh, spring and fall warmth, frost protection, protection from insects um, that would fly in otherwise and land on them. And a uh, the little trick I just read about filling gallon jugs with um, warm water and putting them under the row covers. Then at night for frosty or cold nights, those warm, you know, and from the sun too, on a sunny day, it's going to warm those up. You're going to have a solar mass in there. That's then going to release this heat overnight to um, help your plants stay warm. Because besides sunlight and healthy soil and nutrition, all plants have a heat quotient factor that's important in their growth. That's why if you plant like us, we've had seeds in for quite a while, but they're getting going real slow, but it's because of the temperature. Once it warms up, they'll take off. Um, hardware cloth, quarter inch hardware cloth is good stuff for trellises. Um, Water-based white paint, we put in a bunch of small fruit trees. So that's um, will protect it from winter scalding. And um, if it's lime, you put lime in it, it's supposed to keep some of the ground bugs from crawling up. And there's also a sticky compound you can wrap around the trees for that. Uh, fencing is uh, it's a, kind of a no-brainer around here with deer and rabbits and everything else. I tell people if you're gonna have a garden, you gotta plan, you gotta put a fence up really because it's a real drag and it's happened to me. Um, you know, you have a 50 foot long <laughs> row, row of nice jade green beans coming up and you go out there the next day and they're all mowed down. And, and, uh, so the, the seniors garden that I did in Hillsdale, um, I put an electric fence around that, a solar powered electric fence. Um, that was pretty effective. Uh, the, the electric fence, there's, there's a ribbon and it's kind of loose, it blows in the wind and the deer come up and what's this? And they put their nose up to it and it zaps them and leave it alone. Uh, unfortunately, eventually the turkeys discovered the garden. And so they just, it was a big enough garden that they just, flew in over the fence. So, but uh, with the deer around here, I put up a six foot privacy fence down both sides of our backyard. I think they don't jump over that because they can't see what's on the other side. But across the back, we have a really nice woods and kind of a little glen back there. And we want to see that and we like seeing the deer. So I put a six foot kennel fence. It's a welded wire. It's called kennel fence. It's very inexpensive. It's almost invisible from the house. But I put in eight foot um, steel T posts or farm posts. So the top, the top of the fence is six foot, but the top of the post is eight foot. So, you know, with our soft sandy soil, I knew uh, if any deer jump over that six foot fence, I'm going to see the tracks and then I'm going to run a wire at the top of the post at eight foot, which is what is recommended for deer is eight foot. But they've never jumped in the yard. And, and we've had up to recently, we've had two dogs. I'm sure that helps, but they still haven't come into our yard. Um, so I think that's the cheapest way without, and in and, and Pier Marquette Township in the city, I think most areas there's a six foot limit on fence height. So that would fix that because a simple, a simple wire with maybe a little, you know, Tibetan prayer flag or something hanging every so many feet, they'd see that and it's like, nah, can't jump over that. But you really have to, you don't want to do all that work and, you know, have, uh, have the critters make a nice meal out of it. I mean, I know they're just trying to make a living like everybody else, but hey, you know, go eat something else. Um, 
attracting beneficial animals and insects is important to the ecosystem. They're going to help you out. You can purchase beneficial insects. Um, I've done that several years. I did it for some clients. Um, you have to release them at a specific time, either the eggs, the egg cases, or the actual insects. And the idea, I think it would be great if a lot of people started doing that because we populate eventually. If, if they don't have enough food on your property, they're just going to go somewhere else. So that's, that's good. You're, you're being generous, you know. So if more people did that and we started to populate our area with beneficial insects, that would be a really good thing. And, and then provide, um, you know, habitat for them and plants for them, um, beneficial plants. Um, and just pull the baby's breath out of it, right, Julia? <laughs> so, uh, herbs, flowers, and clovers around borders. We'll go up with that. The third line of defense. See, we have to think defensive in gardening. Um, thick soil tests. That's, that's pretty important. I might even do that. Um, I haven't had any problems with my garden as far as growing things. So I felt like, eh, why bother? But I might do that more for curiosity at this point. Uh, a lot of problems are simple fixes, um, overwatering. You can overwatering and that'll cause wilt as well as underwatering would cause a wilt. So you know, can do a soil test with your hands. You can just scoop up some of the soil, try to pack it into like a snowball. You know, if it holds together, um, and it'll depend on the soil too, but if it holds together pretty good, um, you probably have enough moisture in it. If it just falls apart, it's dry. You can take your, your index finger, stick it down there as far as you can. If, if it feels dry as far as, as you can stick your finger, then you need to water. But that's, that's observation. Um, so overwatering, underwatering can be a problem. Inadequate nutrients, that's where your soil test would come in. Um, Poor drainage is a problem. Um, so I think most people probably know about that. But if you have if you have clay, um, sphagnum peat moss was one of the the big recommendations for clay. Otherwise, that's a good application for a raised bed. And do a deep raised bed. Put some gravel on the bottom. Uh, a little bit of sand over that so your roots aren't going to sit in water and you might even have to to do a, a little drain out of that and dig a little trench or something um, i don't know about everybody else but we are on sand which is much better to work with and amend than clay um, and lack of ventilation things are too close together uh, things um, outside of the veggie garden your uh, fruit trees or ornamental trees or anything else that needs to be thinned out or pruned. Um, but remember, do that properly at the right time of the year. Don't take off too much at once. Uh, yeah. So monitoring daily, watching for wilting, discoloration, distortion of the leaves, holes, spots, eggs, or insects. Um, and then act on that as quickly as possible. Figure out what it is. Um, you know, there's apps for taking photographs and sending it right in to get identification. And then there's MSU extension. Your um, blossoms and fruits, same thing. Spots, discoloring, decay, cuts, holes. If they drop, lack of fruit setting, eggs and insects. Have anything abnormal, and that's the thing about you know, just walk through your garden a lot. Don't just wait till something's ready to pick and then go out. You got to keep an eye on it. And okay. And some other common problems would be acid, acidic soil or MPK deficiencies. Acid medium makes them less biologically available if your soil is too acid. And I find it interesting also that our bodies are um, related to the soil in that way because uh, disease thrives when our bodies are more acidic than more on the alkaline side. So it's important to have our bodies balanced too. And 
Um, you get acidic from a lot of sugar, eating too much sugar, um, too much meat, things like that. So not a good case for going vegetarian. <laughs> We're not quite there, but we're pretty close. <laughs> um, so yeah, get your pH right. There's remedies for that pH test. Um, earthworms, compost, lime, and wood ashes will all help with acidic soil. Alkaline soil, pH above seven, same thing. Take a soil test. Um, you can get those online. You can get them at Lowe's and Home Depot. Um, I think you can get them through the MS, MSU extension and you can send it into their lab. Um, this woman, this professor, this um, science of gardening highly recommends that if you do a soil test that you have it tested for heavy metals. And depending on where you live, if you're out in a rural area, it's not as much of a concern. Um, if you're near a roadway, if you're near any manufacturing, um, industries and things like that and she recommends you get tested get it tested for heavy metals um, and then there's ways of some ways of remediation but you can't totally clean that out of your soil usually um, nitrogen the NPK it is essential for all phases. It's rapidly depleted, depleted, so a slow constant supply like compost is the best way to go. Phosphorus, phosphorus is one of those things you, you can get too much of easily. Um, and that's the bad one that, that gets down into the water and creates algae blooms. So you wanna be careful. Another good reason for a soil test to make sure you don't have too much of something. Um, that's essential for proper fruiting flowering, seed formation, and root branching. And it increases the rate of crop maturation, builds plant resistance to disease, and strengthens the stems. Potassium is the K, NPK. Uh, it's essential for regulating water movement and helps with production of sugars, starches, and proteins in certain enzyme reactions. It also increases cold hardiness, especially in root crops. So if you're having any problems at all, it's probably worth doing a soil test for sure. And then there's all the trace elements. I, I can read those off to you. And uh, magnesium, chlorophyll production and respiration, calcium, water uptake and proper cell development and division, boron, cell wall formation and carbohydrate transport, iron, important for chlorophyll formation. And okay, organic remedies. Beneficial nematodes, which is a parasite that injects insects' eggs with killer bacteria and soil grubs also. Uh, beneficial insects and plants. Botanical controls. Julie is very familiar with neem, neem oil. Neem oil is a broad spectrum organic system. So you want to be kind of careful um, with that because it can be not so good for some of the beneficials. Um, Bacillus thuringiensis, Bt, um, that's a really good one and it's specific. You can get different forms of that for specific problems, um, including mosquitoes. If you have a water pond or something like that, you can get these little tablets, little like little donuts um, and put it in the water for the mosquito larva. Um, yeah, copper, um, is or consider organic copper fungicides, but they it, copper can also kill your earthworms. So earthworms are very good. Um, cultivation, clean cultivation, remove and destroy. Diatomaceous earth is uh, desiccates the insects. You apply that with water. It's like little tiny, sharp little shards from skeletonized um, little creatures in the earth. All cultivation, I think I already hit on that. And um, hand picking, that's really fun. I like hand picking Japanese beetles. They're just so disgusting. And yeah, I think I, I think I have the yuck factor going on there at some of the clients because you know you can pick them and drop them in a bucket of soapy water, but I took pleasure in squishing them between my fingers. <laughs> 
just venting a little bit. Okay, you see a little bug. Um, and they're really bad. They eat just about anything, but they lay their eggs and their larva in the soil. And one of the things that you can do there, and you know, if you want to have a nice green lawn, then this isn't going to work. But um, if it, the soil dries out, their larva is not going to survive. So you break their life cycle that way. Uh, we don't water our lawn as a lawn, as you can call it a lawn. Um, it's definitely not a monoculture. But, but we don't water it and, and grass will turn brown, but the plant doesn't die, it's just the leaves die, the, the grass dies, the roots are still gonna live. So when it rains again, it'll be green again, but you know, that's, uh, that's a value judgment and a, an emotional appeal. Uh, then um, insecticidal things um, for your, for your trees and specifically fruit trees, a horticultural oil, which is called dormant oil. You would spray that in the late winter, early spring. And what that does, it's considered organic. It um, puts a, a film and it seals in the larva of any bugs that have laid their eggs in the little crevices and cracks and crotches of the trees um, so they don't get to hatch. Um, speaking of trees, does everybody know that trees have sex? You know that trees have sex? So, yeah, um, they do. And do you know how you tell the difference between a male and female tree? Anybody know that? No, okay. you check the crotch, of course. <laughs> okay, <laughs> hope I didn't offend anybody. <laughs> I learned that in the Master Gardener course. <laughs> you check the crotch if you want to determine if it's a male or female tree. <laughs> you can watch out, the branch doesn't slap you. Um, hot pepper spray, those kind of home remedy things. It's really, um, it's encouraged to test them out very gingerly on, you know, a leaf or two of your plant before you go spraying it all over the place. And capsaicin, you can get a different, um, heat quotients too so you got to be careful with that insecticidal soap is good i like to use uh, dr broner's because it's a glycerin soap that doesn't it's pretty pure you can get it in different um, flavors i think that uh, i use the citrus because it's a natural repellent for bugs citrus um, and you can there's all kinds of recipes online but they haven't been proven scientifically for efficacy so, but there are things you can try. Integrated pest management, that gets pretty tricky. It's all about timing. Um, that's pretty involved. And I don't know what time it is. I can ramble on. Uh, for a long yeah, time. it's it's 8.15 now. Is it? Yes. Oh and you're, and well, you're getting it, darker. Am I? Yeah. That's my tan. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, well, let me let me go through composting here um, and then save some time for questions. But if anybody needs to leave, you know, I won't be offended. Um, so it's recommended you wear a dust mask and gloves when you're working with compost, especially if it's dry, but you should keep it wet. But um, because there are all kinds of things in there and um, so that's just recommended. Um, should be up on your tetanus shot. Okay, I don't want to scare you right at the top, but it's recommended that you're up on tetanus and you should be up on your tetanus shot anyway. Um, some of the goals is, is on-site recycling. And it's amazing when we get really serious about composting, how much we cut down because, you know, paper plates that we rarely use, but they get the uncoated ones, those can go in the compost, tear them up, you know. Um, Paper towels, which we use as our fancy napkins. We get the rolls that are like half, half width paper towels. Those are napkins. You know, it's got some food scraps on them, you know, a little drool or whatever. That's okay. Put it, that's all carbon. You know, your carbon ratio to nitrogen ratio, ratio is, um, you know, 40 to one or approximately you want like 80% of your compost to be carbon. That's all the brown stuff like um, dry leaves, paper, cardboard, um, 
that type of thing. And the nitrogen or the green is your um, vegetable scraps, um, grass clippings, fresh grass clippings, green, fresh green things. Um, so, you know, you cut down on waste that's going into landfills and dump sites. Um, you're improving your soil quality. You're improving your self-sufficiency. And as I said earlier, you're shooting for a um, self-sustaining garden ecosystem um, and healthy, productive plants. And you save money because the compost is so good, you don't have to buy as much fertilizer. Um, increases the organic content of the soil, improves texture and drainage and fertility. And you don't want, you know, a ton of organic matter in your soil. Um, they recommend about 10% because um, one of the things it does, it binds up the um, heavy metals. Um, do, 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 it's just so good in so many ways to compost. And it's kind of fun, you know, when my kids were little and we had a compost pile, we'd go out there in the winter and it was really cold out and I'd take the pitchfork and take some fresh kitchen scraps out, take the pitchfork and cap it off and it's just steaming, you know, just hot steaming coming out of there. It's just, I don't know, it's kind of fun. Anyway, um, organic matter slows drainage, improves moisture retention in sandy soils, enhances drainage in heavy soils, reduces compaction. Um, six to eight percent of stable plus active organic matter is ideal. Um, stable is considered finished compost. And an active organic matter is when it's on its way, not quite there yet. Um, and that takes, I, know I got my notes mixed up here. Um, okay, scratch that. Uh, PGPB, plant growth promoting bacteria. You get about 300 different kinds in compost. Um, tools that you need for that, I'm gonna go into that. Storage containers, five gallon buckets and bins once it's cured. So once the compost is basically pretty much done, then you still wanna let it cure after that for about a month. And it's good to cover it then so it doesn't leach out into the soil um, below. So you can cover that with pretty much anything that protects it from the rain. Uh, burlap's really good because it protects it from the hard rain, but it also can still breathe. And um, that's a good thing to use. And you can get uh, burlap pretty cheap at that, um, what's it called? The thrift store there on Pier Marquette, just south of 10. I can't think of the name of it now. It's, it's on the left side as you're going south anyway. Just bargains. Yeah, just bargains. Yeah, we love that place. Um, even though we haven't been in it for a year and a half. So uh, I don't know how much people know about composting, but they refer to it as like lasagna. You compost in layers. It's really important to keep it moist. So as you're building it, you might stockpile, you know, leaves and grass clippings and different, it just there's so much that can go in. Nothing from animal fats, um, no meat, you know, obviously no plastic or anything like that, but anything that can break down can pretty much be composted. Um, it's really important as you build it to have a watering can or a hose there with a spray nozzle and just, you want it to be where it's about, um, like the, consist the moisture consistency of a, of a sponge after you squeeze it out. Not, not soaking wet, dripping wet, but good and moist. Um, and then how fast it breaks down is dependent on how much nitrogen you have in there and the moisture and how often you, you turn it for oxygen. Um, there's different things you can do for oxygen. Um, you can put pipes through it with holes drilled in. I have a stack like a chimney in mine with a PVC pipe, it's about four inches with holes drilled in it. And then on the bottom before you build it, crisscross a bunch of, of twigs and branches to let air underneath. Um, then also something I learned in the last few years was um, besides manure, as for a biological activator, you can use cheap dog food, cheap dry dog food um, is cornmeal. So a lot of cornmeal in that. So that works good for an activator. Um, do, do, do. You can do, you can compost weeds and sickly plants 
but you should do it in a separate pile, which is called a hospital heap or hot pile. Um, don't do it in your other compost. Um, it really needs to be cooked to a good heat of 130 degrees, 130 to 170 degrees. Um, so you can compost that. If you're, if you're in doubt, throw it out. Leaves should be chopped or shredded. Leaves take a long time to break down, especially if they're oak, which we have a lot of um, pine needles. So you can chop them up with a mower. Um, you can get leaf shredders, or you can just throw them in, uh, throw them whole and off to the side and let them sit for a whole year and stir them up. Kind of, and it'll start to turn into leaf mold and then compost them. Uh, yeah, paper cardboard is good. You can compost that. Um, it used to be that you didn't want to compost things with colors, but the colors are now, they don't have lead in them. The colors are from soy. So uh, nothing waxy should go in there. Um, keep it wet, put it wet before you put it in there. Um, tear it up or shred it. Nutritional activators, like I said, are dog food. Um, Plant-based meals or pellets, alfalfa, canola, corn, soybean, and uh, earthworms. Yay, that's it. Okay, I mean, there's so much. Um, and, and again, I, I'll try to answer any questions I can, but I think the most thing I can do for you is refer you um, the list that Julia is gonna have on there. I, you know, like I said, I've had so many gardening books over the years, but I can throw them all out and keep that one book um where i put it anyway the a to z guide to organic food elliot coleman's four season harvest mm -hmm. for people that want to really extend their season is a really um classic and um i got another new one here recently uh, the fruit gardener's bible and that does uh, from from blueberries and brambles through all the fruit trees and that is like an awesome book um, so I think it's really important to have books, and I know we have the internet, but we may not always have the internet. The internet sometimes fails, or you want to know something and somebody else is on the computer and you want to know it now. You're probably not going to want to take your computer out into the garden with you. Um, you know, you're not going to get your, your Wi-Fi there. You can take a book out with you. Um, governments have been shutting down the internet when there's civil unrest, which I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see civil unrest in this country. Um, I think it's really nice to have hard copies of important things. And I think, I think gardening is an important thing. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend these books. Yes. So, okay, Thank you, Al. Questions. We, we love, I'm sure most of us love books. I love a good book too. Are there any questions if you want to uh, go to the reaction and do the, either do a chat or raise your hand? Carla, did you have a question? No. Do I have to oh, click? I just, I, there was so much information that uh, I've got to digest it. Okay. <laughs> that was a good pun. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah, there, it's, it's infinite. You're, you're dealing with life itself, you know? Yes, uh, you are. Yeah. 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 And, and right. it's infinite. I mean, even this, this professor, um, she's got her PhD in horticulture and she's, she's still learning and experimenting. So, yeah, um, that's why I, I really think the most that I could do is, I, I, like I say, I've looked at a lot of, I have a lot of resources, but you know, the extension and, the, and those particular books, um, yeah, and, and beware of the, the pop. I've seen a lot of pop articles and that, and I'm like, no, that's all wrong. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, um, by there, let's see. What is the best type of wood for chips from bar? Um, Pardon? Barb, Barb Trudeau asks, what's the best wood oh. for chips? Um, birch, birch is really good. Birch is really good. But any, any um, wood, any hardwood, preferably. Um, chunky is good and, and laid on thick. Um, weeds may come up, but they're really easy to pull. I, I like um, cedar. I use cedar. You can, you can get that at, it's not Grasse's anymore, it's the, the market. market. You can get it in bulk. Yeah, if you have a pickup truck or a trailer or they'll deliver, um, depending on, on how much you need, um, 
three yards is a pretty nice pile of, of mulch, but cedar is a natural um, bug repellent, mm -hmm. right? I think cedar closet. Um, it's natural. It's not dyed. You can get natural cedar. There's another type of cedar. They do something with it. Just get natural cedar. That's that's my favorite. But pretty much, um, you know, arborists. Uh, if you got a tree guy in the neighborhood, and they're chipping, um, they'd probably be really happy to dump it at your house. If you walk down to the neighbors, it's getting that work done, because then they don't have to haul it someplace and find a place to dump it. Um, and you just have to shovel it around. <laughs> But yeah, this um, this professor um, Linda Linda called no Linda Chalk Chalklin Scott um, she just pounds that in so much yeah wood chips wood chips wood chips that's the best mulch great Oak any is, other is any other any other questions we must have covered it all huh no way. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Sorry if I jumped around a lot. <laughs> Just so much. No more um, questions. If, if anybody hasn't seen on Facebook, Al has a nice picture of his garden, your garden, wasn't it on Facebook that I just saw? Yeah. Yeah. Alan Haslam. Yeah. yeah. Says so ready, your set. Friends with, pardon? Yeah. The, the caption I put on there was ready, set, grow. Everything's yeah. all ready to, to go, yep. Yeah, but I, I had some questions that I was writing down, but you addressed them all. So I just thought, well, I'll have some here. Okay. Yeah, great. Okay. Well, thank you. And, and if you have any other questions, you can get a hold of me or one of the boards. Al, Alan used to be on our board. I forgot to mention that. He was on our board for quite a while and did quite a bit. We had a few other board members. Carla's here and Kathy Horowski and mm -hmm. Heidi Maloney was a board member and Kathy Wincheski. And so it's neat to see that people are still involved. So I guess we will close it. I We are going to put this up on this recording on the website and you will get a list of resources. I guess I need to practice my zoom 